Welcome to Bigger Pie Forum Podcast. We are delighted today to be have Mark Mills as our guest to talk to us about uh, his views on some of the important issues of today. For our viewers who are not familiar with Mark Mills, he has a, a very impressive background. Uh, he's authored a number of books. He is uh, on the energy and power area. The, he's considered by many an expert and has been on the speaking circuit talking with you know a variety of uh, high-level groups, the um, investors and universities and other type uh, audiences on the subject of the green energy plans, of the, the uh, transition of fossil fuels uh, to um, renewable energy and, the, and also the transition of EVs to from uh, the internal combustion engine automobiles. The, um, I first came across Mark about 20 years ago when he joined forces with George Gilder and Peter Huber to develop uh, the, POSM, the, the PowerCosm conferences and PowerCosm newsletter, investor newsletter that they put out for a number of years there. He and Peter Huber also co- uh, co-wrote an important book, The Bottomless Well, The Twilight of Fuel, The Virtue of Waste, and Why We Will Never Run Out of Energy. It was a, ended up being a very prescient book. It was written back during the time frame when there was a large you know, uh, part of the investment community that was uh, convinced that we were reaching peak oil and uh, that we were going to be running out of oil in the near future. And um, he made the case intellectually, or he and Peter Huber made the case intellectually in the book that that was not the case and that new technologies would produce oil and gas for many, many decades to come. That was before the term fracking had been heard, but it ended up being a very prescient in you know, a warning or t- telling people about the potential for, for new sources of uh, oil and gas in the years and decades ahead. In, in 2021, two years ago, he published uh, The Cloud Revolution, how the convergence of new technologies will unleash the next economic boom in a roaring 2020s. Mark's a great writer, a great uh, connector of dots, but he's most of all, I think, really good at explaining very, very complex subjects in a way that people can understand them and grasp uh, the ramifications of um, you know, the, what the new technologies. And he's trained us in physics and a lot of the stuff he writes about is stuff that is impacted by physics and new technologies that get much of their um, insight from the world of physics. The, so it's exciting to have him here in town in, in Jackson to uh, uh, speak at a luncheon today. And he's, we're lucky to have him come by and visit with us this morning. The, um, oh, the last thing I want to mention, and, and perhaps uh, I think maybe, you know, um, very central to our discussion is that back in the 1980s, uh, fresh out of getting his you know, physics uh, degrees, he uh, went to work for the Reagan administration as a science advisor. And, and that's important because uh, the, the Reagan administration from 1980 to 1988 was a period of uh, great economic um, recovery and, and boom that involved a lot of new technologies that were reaching critical mass and producing economic growth and sort of reinventing, reordering the the economy, not only of the United States, but of the world economy. And uh, I'm interested in how he views uh, his experience there in in that time period in the 80s with the the, um, confrontations we are now meeting with uh, energy transitions, but both the, inter- the transition from um, fossil fuels to renewables and also the transition of our vehicles from um, internal combustion engines to uh, EVs. But, uh, but it's great to have you here with Bigger Pie Forum. And we, we you know, focused on Mississippi's economy mm-hmm. and and the um, we've spent the great, a lot of time. The great, the great state of Mississippi. The great state of Mississippi. Right. Please. Yeah. We spent a lot of time uh, in our the past 10 years since we've been doing this, focused on energy because of the electricity and right. cost of electricity. So the we spent a lot of time 
you know, chastising the Public Service Commission and and trying to, you know. Deservedly so, usually. Deservedly so, right. (laughs) So, but it's great to have you here to talk about this really important subject. I mean, there's so many things that you can talk about, and I've enjoyed all of them in uh, in the years that um, I've been following you and your readings, but going all the way back to the PowerCosm conferences where you and Peter Huber, oh, went, I went sure. to some of those. Or the PowerCosm uh, Cognoscenti, one of the, <laughs> <laughs> the <clears throat> those are a lot of fun. And also. the newsletters were great too, or the, yeah. or the investment letters were great too. Yeah. So, Thank so um, and the, um, a, a couple of things I want to say just from his background. Um, first of all, he's, he's a great writer. He's written some really good books. Uh, and he's really good at explaining things. Mark is great at explaining things, looking at the big picture, distilling it down, and then connecting the dots within that distillation in a way that, that helps people uh, who are don't have PhDs in physics understand things that well, are very, I, very complicated. I, I don't either. I quit before I could get my PhD. <laughs> Sorry, one, one of the more important I should I should have quit earlier. I mean... Uh, Elon Musk quit uh, early, and yeah. Bill Gates quit early, and That's right. I didn't quit early enough. Yeah, Larry Ellison, I think he quit, <laughs> he quit early. early. Yeah, there's a lesson in that. <laughs> That's right. Peter Thiel's I, trying to get people to drop out. I know. I wish I'd met Peter Thiel early on in the game. <laughs> All right. So much but, for that. But I, yeah, I did go to graduate school, but I quit. I, I was okay. working, build, building microprocessors and semiconductors, and and trying to invent invent stuff and anti missile systems and all, outstanding all kinds of. Well, that gets to my first sort of question I was going to ask you is a, a, to frame it. Uh, let me mention the two books here, The Bottomless Well, The yeah. Twilight of Fuel. There's three books, but the ones that two, The Twilight of Fuel, The Virtue of Waste, and Why We Will Never Run Out of Energy. This yeah. was really prescient because yeah. it came at a time when the, a lot of the investment folks were saying, we're going to peak oil, yeah. we're going to run out of oil. Right. And this made the case that, no, that's not the case. Right. In fact, fracking came up and proved that you were right, yeah. and all the the nice all the worry warts about peak oil were wrong. It's nice to be right for the right reason, but I'll right. I'll take being right by by luck as well. But okay, the, you know it, it, you put your finger on it. So when Peter and I wrote this book, my my, my yeah. longtime uh-huh. friend and colleague who sadly died yeah. a couple of years ago prematurely, uh, the the peak oil theory was peaking. It's coming back again, by the way. It's not like they ever give up. The, the Malthusians. Um, just can't stop themselves from believing we're running out of stuff. Uh, we're not running out of anything except common sense, but that's but that's episodic in hu- human yeah. affairs. So the idea was uh, after the oil embargo of '73, which ironically is exactly 50 years ago this month when, it, when it, that that, yeah. that searing event began and may happen again. And then we had '79 um, Iranian Revolution, which led to another price hike. So over a period of that, this, this late, the '70s. Oil prices went up five hundred percent, which was a pretty and stayed up. Yeah. And then they relaxed back down in the eighties, but not to the level they were before. Uh, so we've had an expensive oil world, which caused everybody to think we're running out of oil. Um, we weren't running out of oil; we were running, <laughs> we we were running out of friends, uh, in effect. But now now we're in a different stage, uh, where people think we're burning too much oil. Basically, so it's if you're simplifying the policies of the United States and the world, is that we began 50 years ago with hundreds of billions of dollars of spending at the federal level, that much again at the state level, to avoid using oil, to look for alternatives to oil. And, and what the private market did was produce more oil. <laughs> Hence the, the shale revolution, which Peter and I essentially forecast in its frame and form, uh, that we weren't running out of oil. What we were going to see was another cycle of innovation in the oil fields and, and you know, Effler, an efflorescence of right. oil. <clears throat> so that happened. And now now we have legislation saying, in effect, we shouldn't be burning the oil. There's too much to keep it in the ground. And so we're now, again, monomaniacally pursuing alternatives to oil. So the two errors are linked by this, the same thing. The, the hope and belief in the spending of massive amounts of federal taxpayers' dollars on alternatives to oil and gas and coal. But oil is sort of the, the, the pinata of the environmental yeah. movement. They hate big oil, they hate oil, they hate everything about oil. And yet, uh, if you looked at the stretch of modern history or all of human history, the single most remarkable thing that's happened to humanity is we've not only improved the ability for people to, to live and function, for civilization to operate with cheap energy, we've done it for so many more people that it's l- literally unprecedented in the, in the affairs of history. And it's on the backs of hydrocarbon machines burning oil, gas, and coal. It's, th- that hasn't changed. The facts haven't changed. The benefits haven't changed, except 
we still have this now, this new mantra, we, we shouldn't be burning oil, we shouldn't be burning coal, we shouldn't be burning natural. And, we, and as you well know, the, we, we now are being told that the new stuff is inevitable. It's cheaper and better. Electric cars are cheaper and better. Solar panels and wind turbines are cheaper and better. And so let's just accelerate this inevitable revolution to cheaper, better magic. Right. That's a long way of answering right. the bottom I, as well, which was, which was a book I, w I wanted to write. Peter and I, before he died, we started writing a second edition. Oh, is that right? Really? And uh, it, it, this will be the first time I'll say this publicly, but I'll but happily say it. Our publisher wouldn't release the, the copyright to let us do a second edition because it's, quote, still in print. You can buy the book still. Go on Amazon and type bottom as well, and you'll get our book. Uh, because you can print on demand now. So, okay. Uh, we would. We wanted to write a, you know, a second edition. What was going? What additional points would you have made in the second edition? Well, well first you'd update all the data. So this, okay. the data, the data are now fifteen years old. So you want to see if the trends continue. They all, they all have. Nothing in the underlying physics of energy have changed. And then what we did is we looked at each chapter and say, well, what are the things that we missed, or did something different happen since we wrote about it? Are there corrections we'd like to make? And uh, of course, with a little bit of hubris. Peter and I said, there was nothing to correct here. <laughs> we got it all right, <clears throat> which in the physics we did. But there, there have been uh, geopolitical events we, we, we couldn't anticipate. One would be, we have a chapter on global warming and climate change in the book. Uh, we, neither of us anticipated the magnitude of mania of maniacal spending to avoid burning hydrocarbons. We didn't anticipate that. Uh, we, we probably naively thought that the, the train would run out of steam before we got to a level of insanity. And now I, I, I think we're at a spending level that's borderline insane. Yeah, the, 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 it's really staggering when you look at the deficits that they're running up and, and the willingness to do it even when the economy is doing pretty well. But th let me make, make a point here. You wrote this book. The second book I wanted to point out was The Cloud Revolution, which mm -hmm. you published in 21, yeah. which tries to you know capture what, what's all going with the computer cloud, uh, which is not actually a cloud, but it's in big server farms, right. I guess. And and uh, but it, again, it demonstrates your you know um, you know uh, comprehension of all the different things going on in technology. And uh, it's a great uh, great read. I strongly recommend that as well. But let me jump back all the way back to the Reagan administration, which enjoyed a, an economic boom in that time period. You were a science advisor at that point to the mm -hmm. Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what lessons you may have learned back then or observations from that time period, yeah. that economic boom, and how it applies, if, if it does apply, to the current situation. We're looking, we're hoping for a roaring 2020s, yeah. but also we face these two big transitions yeah. that we're spending so much money on, both the transition from fossil fuels to renewables on the power side, but also the transition of vehicles from uh, internal combustion engine to the EVs. Right. Are there any lessons from your period in the Reagan administration that you can apply to this? I mean, yeah, I think there are, but... Uh, <laughs> or is it that not the right way to try to no, tackle think, the situation? <clears throat> I, think, I think there are some lessons. Before we talk about the transition, I mean, because I think there's a, um, there's a perception in how we talk about this that uh, is not properly reflected in what words mean. I, I, you know, I, I'm a data guy, I like, okay. I like data, but also I'm a writer and I think words have meaning. Um, so there is no energy transition going on. So It's just an addition. It's a, just an addition and it's not even a significant addition yet at the scales that matter globally. Which, it, it, to put it in, in its simplest possible terms, and I'll describe the lessons, but the simplest possible terms is that the world has been quote climate aware, let's call it, for at least a couple decades. And we've been spending globally trillions of dollars to avoid burning hydrocarbons for at least a couple of decades. I mean, literally trillions. The, the, the cumulative direct spend is over five trillion, according to the International Energy Agency. The indirect spend is at least another five trillion. So we're sort of ten trillion dollars of spending to avoid hydrocarbons. Most of the spending is going to wind and windmills and solar solar panels uh, and other stuff. But that, that's in the noise. That's the that's the big spend. So where are we today? I mean, after twenty years of this, well, almost four percent. 4% of the world's energy is supplied by wind and solar combined. Almost 4%, okay? Not nothing, it's a big world. 4% is not a transition and it yeah. ain't accelerating. Uh, for calibration, burning wood, burning wood one of the, it is the oldest known right. <laughs> source of energy of mankind. Burning wood provides 
10% of world's energy today. Is that right? 10%. Really? So most people wouldn't think that's the Bert, case. Bertie, well, what? Mississippi and North Carolina export wood pellets to Germany and England to coal fire with coal uh, to, to make them green fuels. <laughs> Uh, in a feat of regulatory leisure domain, you are helping the energy transition of uh, the United Kingdom by burning Mississippi wood. I think it's great. Uh, wood trees grow again. Um, That's true. Let's sell the wood as pellets. But, but globally, wood is still a big energy source. In fact, in absolute terms, to your point of the addition, the total amount of fuel provided by burning wood has not decreased for centuries. Is that right? What's happened is we've added other stuff. Okay. First it was coal, and then it was hydro dams, and then it was oil, and then natural gas, and then nuclear power. And now we're adding wind and solar, and great, let's, we're going we're gonna to need the old, the old uh, uh, pilloried expression, we're going to need all the above, is in fact true. But this is not a transition, so those numbers matter. Okay. Uh, and on the car side, a factoid that's useful is that we, we have been spending a lot of money to avoid using oil in cars. Um, not just electric transportation, which is the new, the new, uh, the new fashion. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells were a fashion for a while under the, the Bush 43 administration. Uh, ethanol has uh, uh, gone from being a fascination and obsession to fully locked into the pantheon of what we genuflect that, whether you're Republican or Democrat, we're not going to shut down the corn farms. That now we now we now have more land uh, under crop to fuel transportation growing corn than we did in the 1800s to fuel horses. So there's right. more grain going to transportation today than there was then. But it's a trivial share of the global transportation. 95% yeah. of the world's transportation of goods and people burns oil, 95%. And of the 5 percentage points that are left, more than half of that is burning food, alcohol, which can generally be put to a better purpose and my opinion, than burning it yeah. in a gas tank. And then a few percentage points is bio, you know, not even one percentage point, biodiesel, which is another form of food made into fuel. So it's, it's an oil story. It's been an oil story for all of the industrial revolution. It's still an oil story. And even if you believed that the electric vehicle revolution is going to be subsidized into an expansion of the scales people are talking about, the world has about 15 million EVs on the road today. That's a lot more than zero, which it was a decade ago, roughly. The world has 1.5 billion light duty vehicles. That's a lot of cars. And there'll yeah. be more than 1.5 billion 10 years from now. If we assume that we increase by 20 fold all the EVs to 300 million, which is in the wildest imaginations of the advocates, that will not cut 10% of world's oil use. We'll have a 10 percentage point decline in world oil use if we achieve that. That's not nothing in the oil markets. Oil, oil markets fight for 10 percentage points, but it's hardly an existential threat to the oil industry, and it's not the end of the oil age. So it's an addition. So even if we subsidize away to that many EVs, we'll still be burning lots of oil. In fact, in absolute terms, we'll probably be burning more oil, even with that many EVs. Just because the pie is growing bigger, the energy exactly. pie exactly has and to, trans to grow. Transporting heavy equipment, airplanes are not gonna go to batteries. Yeah. Small ones can and little drones. Um, we're not going to make mining equipment and industrial equipment go battery powered. Tiny niche markets, yes. It's a massive market. The world's a big place. And the myth that we're transitioning is a, it, it, it's not just a myth and it's not just a lie. It's actually uh, prima facie silly. It's not, there's no transition happening. And more importantly, it's not technically possible. It's not a question of aspiration. We can't build as much stuff as people imagine to affect the quote transition in the timeframes that are being proposed in the next couple of decades. It requires a construction program greater than what we did for World War II on a, on a sustained basis, not for four years, but for 30 years. You've, you've mentioned in I've, some of the things I've seen you uh, talk on, on different presentations about mm -hmm. the challenge with minerals mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we don't have the minerals to meet the, or there's a logistical challenge here of, of you can have great promises and aspirations from the politicians, but yeah. there's no, there's, they, it doesn't fit with the logistics that we've got in place. Can you go into detail on the minerals, the challenges there? Yes, it, it, it was a stealth story. I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal now, I think it's three or four years ago. It was 
the, the first time to my knowledge anyone publicized an international energy agency study. And they did a study in the same year they issued their net zero roadmap. And the net zero roadmap got a lot of media attention and they did a lot of PR around, you know, the transition to net zero carbon dioxide. And in that same uh, month, they published their critical minerals, energy minerals analysis. To their credit, they did a really good job. It's a several hundred page long document looking at what they call energy minerals. To explain it in simplistic terms, uh, when you build a combustion turbine for gas uh, or, or an engine to burn oil to make power or drive, drive shaft or a, a coal plant, majority of the minerals you're using in tonnage terms are steel, iron and steel, and there's some nickel, and a, a few rare elements uh, to make the motor generators, like neodymium to make, and some copper in the, in the, in the generators. But it's mostly iron and steel. In the wind, solar, and battery world, it's mostly exotic minerals like copper and nickel, and ma manganese, and, and cobalt, and graphite. And it's a whole suite of what energy minerals you need to build solar panels and windmills. Rare earth elements, too, that by the way, aren't rare. Um, they have rare properties. So neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, these exotically named things everybody's forgotten from their high school chemistry. <laughs> they're, they're called rare earth elements because they exhibit special rare properties that make okay. magnets very powerful. But the elements are not rare. They're common. We just don't mine them here. We used to. We let China take over that industry. They now produce the vast majority, well over 80% of the world's uh, mined and refined rare earth elements, which are essential for everything from smartphones to the generators and wind turbines. But So the mineral suite is what matters. What you'd want to know if you uh, were an investor or a policymaker, uh, if you are a serious person, is how much minerals do I need to deliver the same energy to society? What I really care about ultimately is how much stuff do I have to dig out of the ground to build machines that can deliver a mile of driving, a mile of light, an hour of heat, an hour of light, an hour of computer time. Because ultimately the transformation you're doing is digging stuff out of the ground, build machines. The machines produce the energy. You deliver the energy to market with more machines and wires and pipes. <clears throat> we actually know the answer to that question. The mineral requirements, the physical minerals have to be dug out of the earth to deliver the same unit of energy to society, the same unit of energy service, is between 400% and 7,000% higher, depending on the mineral, to go, quote, green instead of staying with hydrocarbons. That can be translated into the demands for mining because you've got to dig the stuff up. And you get the same ratio of increase in mining. You're going to have to increase the world's mining sector for each of these minerals from 400% to 7,000%. Not in a century, not a lot in a century, but in the next decade. All these plans are talking about building all these windmills and solar arrays to transition the world away from hydrocarbons mean by definition, there's no trick on this, you gotta be a lot more mining in the planet. We know one thing about the mining industry, uh, it's very slow, it's slower than any other industry on the planet. It takes on average, according to the IEA, it's their study, 16 years to open a new mine. So do the math here, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna have enough minerals by 2030 to build all this stuff, but we have to have an increase of 400% to 7,000% in mining in a net new mine takes 16 years on average to build. The world, again, according to the IEA, needs hundreds of new mines. Not a few, not one or two, hundreds, which will cost hundreds of billions of dollars. So let's just follow the money trail since in the end, it's always about the money. Is the mining industry spending the money to expand the world's mining capacities? We know the answer to that. It's affirmatively and clearly, no. There's some expansion going on, but we need expansion <laughs> of epic proportions. In fact, the world's mining industry's announced plans and commitments are roughly one-tenth of what's required to meet the 2030, 2035 goals for wind, solar, and electric vehicles. So you have gotta ask yourself what's gonna happen. And this is a good question. What, <clears throat> is it a fact that, uh, or is it because the mining companies are skeptical about whether this is gonna continue? <laughs> <laughs> Makes you kind of wonder, doesn't it? Yeah. The uh, the other thing, of course, it brings uh, uh, sh shows that that um, all the incentives and subsidies from the government are seen to be coming from on the demand side and not on the supply side. And yeah. I guess, should should they be focused more on the supply side, or is it just is this something that's 
not going to come to fruition as some folks hope it does. So it's, there's, I'm going to answer it's two parts. Sure. Should it happen? Should we focus more on the supply side? Uh, and then what's going to happen? So it, it we shouldn't be sub. This is industrial policy writ large. Right. So let's be, be clear. And they are focusing on the supply side now. In fact, they're providing uh, subsidies to battery assembly and uh, plants in America. Right, okay. And the, uh, uh, the dirty little secret is there are subsidies that w- are without limit. Kind of unprecedented in, in congressional history. The Inflation Reduction Act, six or seven hundred billion dollars of direct spending, is is not the whole picture. So Goldman Sachs, to their credit, and Wood McKenzie, which is a consultancy in the energy business, costed out the total mandated subsidies, the, the credits manufacturers will get for battery and electric vehicle plants. And it looks like two to three trillion dollars of spending in the next decade are being allocated now to this energy transition. Put that in context, World War II cost the United States over that four year period, four trillion dollars in today's dollars. So this is the largest allocation of capital in industrial markets in all of modern history, with the one exception, World War II. And that was only for four years, and the war ended. So this will end too, because it's going to be peak subsidies, because even that $3 trillion isn't close to what's required to getting what we need. It's not even close. Worse than that, the subsidies are already being perverted. So the the credit you can get, let's do cars, since people okay. like cars, and, and, and as a matter of sort of social and economic reality, a car is the single most expensive product that 95% of Americans will ever buy. House is not a product, it's an asset, right? Okay. So if you look at products that manufacture, degrade, and depreciate, the single most expensive product almost any human being ever buys in modern society, other than the ultra-wealthy who can own jets and, you know, yeah. Expensive yachts. yachts. And yeah. that's not, that's roughly 5%. So cars are, are, are the single most expensive depreciable asset that people, people buy. And it's an incredibly important market. So tinkering with that market means you're tinkering with something pretty fundamental. The automobile is, is to say it's interstitial in the structure of modern civilization is it trivializes how important it is to yeah. most people. So you want cars to be reliable and inexpensive and useful. So we're going to pervert the car market now with trillions of dollars of subsidies and ban your ability to buy in 12 states a conventional car. We're going to make it illegal in the early 2030s. And the EPA, if it gets its way, with its tailpipe rule, will make it illegal, essentially, by default for U.S. automakers to make more than one third of their vehicle fleet as non-electric. So it'll basically mandating through regulatory leisure domain again that EVs are the only thing you can build. See, when you look at this, you think, well, is this a good idea? Can, we, can I subsidize the supply? Look, forget whether they get cheaper or not. Can I subsidize the supply of copper and nickel and lithium enough to get enough lithium, copper, nickel, and manganese, and graphite, and cobalt, and all the rest to, uh, to make these? I guess in theory, I mean, it's money's guess free to these planners. It's printed infinitely, but as a practical matter, you can't. If these are massive global industries, we don't like mining in America. So what we're really doing is subsidizing Chinese refining. We're subsidizing African and South American, and some Australian and Canadian the homeland as beneficiary of this. And what they're, what the administration is doing is they're artfully rewriting the rules. So you, you don't get a subsidy. You don't get you uh, a check. $7,000 check and change to buy an electric vehicle, unless a certain percentage of the vehicle's content, especially the battery, is American or free trade partner sourced. Okay, in those words, hangs a lot of opportunity. So what you're gonna do, find happening, it's already happening as we get to define how minerals flow from Africa and get refined in regions of free trade partnership and then ultimately flow to America. So the, the labor, the mining, the environmental challenges from mining are not happening in America. They're being pushed offshore. And the money and the benefits from American taxpayers funding this thing are being pushed offshore. Wow. Maybe that's a good idea, you'd think. It'll make copper cheaper. I don't think so. If we increase the demand for a commodity by two to 300%, 400%, 1,000%, but increase the supply by 50%, this, you don't have to be an economist to know that that is that that demand against the restricted supply will have price escalation. So we we should expect uh, epic commodity 
mineral price escalation that is essentially unprecedented in modern history in the coming several years. It's not me saying that, by the way. The International Monetary Fund's economists did a paper looking at the consequences of this, de this demand pull with subsidies against the supply realities. Can you, can you open the mines fast enough, even with an infinite supply of money? Well, the answer is no, you can't, and we're not going to. So this leads to the bottom line. What, what will happen? Price of minerals will go up. Uh, since the battery is the single most expensive thing in an electric vehicle, it's more expensive than the engine and drivetrain combined in a, in a conventional vehicle. It's a third of the cost of the vehicle. 70% of the cost to make a battery is in the cost of the minerals that you buy to make the battery. This is really an easy ipso facto. If the most expensive thing is the battery, 70% of the cost of making the battery is in the buying the minerals, there's going to be a short of mineral production and refining capacity, the price will go up. So the vehicles will get more expensive, not cheaper. There will arguably not be enough minerals to make the quantity of vehicles people normally choose to buy. So that means cars will, that you already have, you'll run longer, which means the price of used cars will go up. So the market for used cars, which are generally goes to lower income households, becomes constrained because the people who have the car that's used are not gonna give it up unless you pay them a lot. And so the entire car market is now going to be marching to a path of economic self-destruction of high prices. Sheesh. That's, it. That's, that's, why, that's why I have a podcast called The Last Optimist. And I, I, I haven't mentioned that yet, but he's got a very successful <laughs> podcast with a lot of these subjects that he discusses on The Last Optimist, and I would encourage our listeners to, to go check it out. I think the, the title of your last one was EVs and the Simplicity Trope, yeah. which was, well, I guess, published on September 11th. But yeah, the... You've done a I'm great over, job. I'm overdue of, for another one now. <laughs> you, you, you're probably much more reliable than I am with getting my podcast out. Oh, no, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but so, what are your other topics? I mean, it's a you know great list of of uh, different issues that are really important to the economy today. Do you have any new topics you're in? You know, how do you come up with your topics for your podcast? Something just hits you. Yes, there's this, there's a it's a rich field of insane things being said and happening <laughs> okay. in the world. You just uh, so in my book, The Cloud Revolution, which is a, a, bit, a bit of a misdirection in the title in the sense that it's about energy, it's about manufacturing, about entertainment, it's about um, healthcare, because what I'm looking at is the pantheon of technologies that are changing. But the thread and all the technology changes that's interesting in our times, of course, is computing and AI and the cloud and this incredible collapse in cost of a profoundly useful tool. And that is what people are afraid of, artificial intelligence, is being a destructive tool, like all tools. Tools can be used for destruction uh -huh. and for benefit. It's net-net a profoundly uh, constructive and productivity-creating tool. So that's the reason that I wrote the book. And as a topic matter at the intersection of the two worlds, I did an earlier podcast on the energy cost of AI because we have sort of two universes in the chattering classes. Those who like to talk about computing and its dystopian effects, uh, or if you're an investor, you know, betting on NVIDIA and Microsoft. And right. uh, as you know, as you mentioned at the outset, I, I used to write with Peter in investment newsletter, so I can't avoid my roots in still doing that. And then you have another class of people talking about energy, and, and they operate in, as if they're independent magisteria. Like there's no relationship between these things. Right. Well, you have to plug computers in. Who knew? And you have to make electricity to run them. So curious minds would wonder, how much? And two decades ago, I did a study um, at the energy appetite of the global internet and published it to, to much unhappiness of the environmental community. I, made, I just made a guess at that time. We didn't have good data. The share of the world's electricity going to computing broadly. And I guessed it was five to 10%, which is a big number. And it was probably more like 5%. And so the question you'd have today, what is it today? Well, it's bigger because there's more compute. More interesting question is, where is it going? So today, the global cloud, everything associated with computing, making computers, smartphones, data centers, which are the warehouse scale buildings that are full of, of servers and storage devices and co compute function. And of course, the networks that get the information to you, whether wired or wirelessly, all those things in combination use twice as much electricity as the country of Japan. It's a lot of electricity to run the global cloud. It, there was zero to run a global cloud 30, 40 years ago because there was no global cloud. Yeah. So do you, 
how much electricity is used to fuel EVs in the world today? One tenth as much as the global cloud, one tenth. How much electricity will we use 10 years from now to fuel an AI infused global cloud compared to all the EVs in the world? The ratio will probably stay about the same because artificial intelligence is to compute energy consumption what a semi-trailer is on the roads compared to say a lime scooter or a right. smart car. Uh, it's the most energy intensive use of silicon in the history of the computing age. It's because to have machines do learning, machine learning, and they do. I mean, this is what's one of the magical things about artificial intelligence. You can teach a piece of software a limited task, recognize a picture of a cat. Turns out that's harder than people thought, but it takes energy to build these machines. It takes energy to run the machines, and then it takes energy to do what's called inference. And AI, you train it to recognize the cat. And then once the software's trained, in silicon, you then put it in other silicon, the software can be transported as we all know when we update our phone, and then, then that silicon does the inference, the recognizing, and uses energy to do that. But it's a very energy intensive process. It, uh, put it in concrete terms, uh, training a piece of software to do a very simple task once, and you can't just train them once. When the tasks change, you have to, there's millions of kinds of tasks, but the tr for a very specific task, like recognizing a cat video, the electricity used by the computer to do the training, roughly equal to the amount of electricity a Tesla would use uh, to drive something on the order of 50,000 miles. So you say, well, big deal. There's only that one training task. Well, yeah, but then you gotta run it. And running it uses thousands of miles worth of Tesla equivalent electricity. And then there are thousands, in fact, I would argue millions of tasks that we would like to have computers perform for us, especially the boring tasks. You know, the first applications of AI are in the most boring of tasks, not replacing skilled labor. Can't do that. Not smart enough. Not gonna be for a very, very long time. But you know, f filling out forms or chatbots, the, the bane of most of our existence, getting wow. a damn chatbot when you try to get an answer to a question, like changing your ticket. Or, if, if most of the times the question you have an, that you have is knowable, it's somewhere in a document, some rule. Now, if a computer were smart enough, it would know all those rules and could answer your question in English, it's called semantic web. That's what AI is on the cusp of permitting to make feasible. Is that good? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <clears throat> is it uh, destructive for jobs? Yeah, same way word processors eliminated, essentially, uh, the secretaries, uh, the secretarial pools, the typewriter eliminated the scribes. Uh, last I checked, we weren't short on labor for anything. We were, we were actually, yeah. we, don't have, we, have, we don't have too many people looking for work. We have an economy with too many jobs looking for people to do them, despite the automation of computing and everything else of the last uh, decades. That's essentially the thesis of my book, is that we are under on the cusp of a massive technological revolution that's only been echoed once before in history, 100 years ago. There are energy implications for that and there are economic implications for that if we let it happen. They're all good, but they're not good if you worry about us using more energy, if you think that's bad. Yeah, all, right. all the stuff creates more demand for electricity. Absolutely. Every, everywhere you go, the, the, whether it's, I mean, it's uh, the quest for the past 250 years, you know, since they figured out, you know, coal and everything else was, the demand for, for its use yeah. goes up and up and up, you know, um, and people find new uses for it. One of the things that worries me is the, just the price of electricity because yeah. of the, the um, the new rules have been are being put in place to, for renewables, etc. In one of your presentations, I saw you talked about um, the company. I think it was Excel, mm -hmm. and uh, the the uh, they had four million customers, electricity customers, right. and as they embraced renewables and increased the the um, ratio of renewables to their uh, total base, that the electricity rates went up you know, a lot higher than the normal person would have thought. Can you yeah. go into some of the details on that? And, and sure. that, that has direct impact on what Mississippi's doing with it, some of its utilities. Well, it's relevant to every state of the union and every, every country in the world. So we have, we have a premise that's being uh, uh, promoted by the enthusiasts for an all wind solar future. And it's very simple. It's repeated over and over again. Wind is cheaper and wind is cheaper. Wind and solar are cheaper than burning oil, gas, or coal and there, therefore we should encourage more of it because it's cheaper. If it were cheaper, uh, you would see the evidence of it being cheaper in every country or state where they've increased the use of 
wind and solar. In every single country in Europe, and the data are available from Eurostat, they, they track data like we do obsessively. Every single country where the share of electricity produced by wind and solar has risen, and every single state of America where the share of wind and solar have increased, have also seen the cost of residential electricity rise. Now, if it were true that this stuff was so much cheaper, it's free, the sun is free, that, well, so is gas, everything's free, that the cost of getting energy to humans is in access to the land where the source exists and the cost of the machines to convert the raw material into something useful. So everything has a cost. If it were inherently cheaper, you wouldn't need subsidies. The market, you'd have, you'd have to get out of the way of the stampede of the market trying to get to the stuff that's free and cheap. Right. So the, the logic of it fails. You don't have to subsidize something that's cheaper. There's no massive lobby in the coal industry to stop you from burning gas because it's cheaper. That's what happened. We switched half of our coal fleet was made economically irrelevant by cheap fracked natural gas. You didn't have to subsidize that, it was just cheaper. If wind and solar were cheaper, you would, would need subsidies. And you would see the evidence in countries. In fact, what the evidence is, is the inverse of so both Excel service territory and in Germany. Germany has done the experiment at a much bigger level. I think there's 60 million people in Germany. So big country, not as big as America, but it's a big yeah. country. They spent trillions of dollars in wind and solar and you, if you follow this stuff, you see occasion they'll brag on a particularly windy or sunny day uh, in the summer that they'll say we got 80% of all the electricity that day from wind and solar. True. Uh, what they did is they built two grids. Over the last 20 years, what Germany did is they shut down their nukes, as we infamously know, a couple of coal plants, but not all of them. And the, the conventional grid is roughly the same size, 80% of the size it was 20 years ago. And they built another grid, an absolute power terms. They've doubled the size of their electric grid. The, the new stuff is all wind and solar. The consumption of electricity in Germany has gone up 6% in that 20 years. Just six, it's not, not the fast growing, it's a big economy then, it's a big economy, but it didn't grow very fast. And they're, well, they're efficient. They're Europeans. They're, yeah. unlike Germans us, are very efficient. Yeah, they're very efficient. So great, good, good on them. Six or 7% increase in electricity consumption. They double the size of their grid. That costs some money. So you, you shouldn't be surprised to learn that the residential cost of electricity in Germany went up 300%. They're, they're paying close to half a dollar a kilowatt hour residentially. That's true in every single country in Europe as the penetration of wind and solar on grids rises, the cost of electricity goes up. Now, keep this in mind. When they put wind and solar on the grids, the residential ratepayer is not paying the full cost of the wind and solar either. There, like here, they're subsidized. So you would think if it's inherently cheaper and the government through taxpayers' money is subsidizing the capital cost, the cost of electricity should have collapsed. <laughs> Plus in that 20 years, the cost of natural gas went down and they were buying cheap gas from the Russians for almost all yeah. the, up until infamously rather right. recently. So what the heck happened? Well, the answer is it's not inherently cheaper. It is true when the wind is blowing at that moment in time, the electricity from a wind turbine is cheaper than the electricity from a gas turbine when the gas turbine is operating at that moment in time. It is also beyond obviously true that you have to produce electricity whenever the markets need it. So what's happening is, is that in order to keep lights on, computers running, economies functioning, the grid is, you have two grids and you're running one suboptimally, which is a definition in economics for making it expensive. And so you have built, you have the capital for two grids in order to keep the lights on it doesn't matter whether you use the gas and coal. Instead of 80% of the time, you're now using it 40% of the time. You still have it, you still need it, and you're running it suboptimally, so which is why the costs have gone up. Those who say, well, we'll just build batteries to solve the problem, which you hear in almost every state regulatory proceeding in the United States. Wind plus batteries, solar plus battery, cheaper than gas turbines. Prima facie nonsense. If it were true, if it were true, first you wouldn't need it, by any incentives, because if that were true, why wouldn't you do it? Everybody would do it. If it were true, every major industrial plant in America that uses huge amounts of power would have cut the wires to the grid long ago, put solar panels up with batteries, and they'd be running on that by themselves. There would be no incentive. Why would they buy expensive public electricity if they could simply cut the wires and build a solar array and batteries and run cheaper? They can't, and they know they can't. So it's a complete lie because it's not in the data. So yet in the simplistic PowerPointification of energy planning, it looks cheaper. 
because it's a PowerPoint, not a power plant. <laughs> How does this? Uh, how, how do we? What happens two or three years from now? I mean, it, it, at some point, do people rise up and say, "We don't want to pay for this," you know, um, electricity that costs three times as much? I mean, how do how do how does this run into the the uh, electorate out there? How how does? That... Well, I, you know, I, I, the the big political question. So that let's just. I know there's a lot of people who, who think that what I'm saying is not true. That it's really cheaper, and Mills is just yeah. you know he's in the pockets of big oil. Or I wish I was in the pockets of big oil. They could write big checks. They got <laughs> making a lot of money these days. Um, I'm being facetious, yeah. obviously. Well, not entirely facetious. <laughs> anyway, look the, the the question you would have politically uh, if you're a policymaker or a politician is if the train wreck happens on your watch, and the train wreck is uh, decreased reliability at epic levels, blackouts, brownouts, rolling and reliability is degrading across the US grids as we increase wind and solar. It's very difficult to keep lights on when you have power plants to turn off arbitrarily when nature chooses. Cloud cover, wind lulls, all these things. Uh, and the other train wreck that's coming simultaneously is the demand for the commodity minerals to build all these things. The demand for those is outstripping our supply, not outstripping the existence of the materials in the Earth's crust. This is no Club of Rome Malthusian stuff. There's plenty of the stuff in the Earth's crust. We have to get to it, get permissions to open up mines, dig the stuff up. That takes decades, not weeks. And billions don't change the velocity of the stuff. So there's a, there's a collision coming on three fronts. The reliability of power will decline in the grids. The cost of electricity and the cost of gasoline are very likely to, to, to hit really ugly uh, spikes again. And the cost to build the machines that you're claiming are cheap, the commodity minerals, are going to spike in the next two or three years. If these three forces, the proverbial perfect storm, converge in the next two or three years, while most of the political class that promulgated this are still around politically, I think there's going to be a hell of a price to pay. I think that's the path we're on, but it's going to take not months. It, 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 sadly, we'll, we're going to spend hundreds of billions more uh, fecklessly on this path before the, uh, we hit peak subsidies and peak nonsense. I think that's, <laughs> that, I think we're, I, the, my optimism, uh -huh. back to my last optimist, <laughs> yeah. is, is and on two fronts. First, it, it, Americans will see it and not be, they'll, they'll see it and be unhappy sooner than Europeans were. So Europe, Europe Germany's are several years ahead of us in this. Germany's exercise, further down right? the path, and they're in yeah. the process of deindustrializing unintentionally. And the German German the political class know that they're in danger of fully deindustrializing because of the cost uh, and availability and reliability of energy in Germany, because of the decision, twofold mistake, counting on cheap Russian gas to essentially fund and hide the exorbitant costs of their wind solar plants. That's what they did. So they were able to shut down nukes and fund wind and solar on the backs of cheap gas. And, German, German finance minister said in almost exactly those words as much a few months ago, that we were lulled into this illusion of an inexpensive transition on the backs of cheap Russian gas. Hmm. So they hit it. So what? Th there's a couple lessons in that. First, you don't want to deindustrialize. That's bad. Yeah. Second is, maybe you want cheap gas. Because <laughs> so, in a cheap gas world, you could afford some a lot more wind and solar in, in EV. I mean, we're, we're rich. So my optimism comes to the fact we will not tolerate Electricity to cost half a buck to a dollar a kilowatt hour. Americans will revolt long before that happens. They'll revolt at low, low, low reliability grids long before Europeans have because we're kind of an intolerant yeah. nation that way. Right. That's where, and, and I think uh, we have the luxury that we really are a wealthy nation. So this, this is, I, I'm no fan of squandering money with the, uh, the state forcing us to spend hundreds of billions of dollars unproductively. But I will say that we can, we'll survive it. We're a $23 trillion economy. It, it's a, we, we're a, a massive economy with an incredible amount of inertia in it. We are going to waste a trillion dollars. Okay. If we're locked in. It's, it's legislated. Unless Congress, a new Congress has the proverbial cojones to say, enough, stop, we're, we're going to cancel this spending, which I don't believe it's hard to believe they take it just think yeah. the republicans if they get the house are going to do it they may gut it a bit and, but 
The train is rolling. We're going to spend a lot of money. It will become clear that we two things will happen. The cost of energy and commodities will go up, the reliability will decrease, and the claims being made that this stuff is better, cheaper, will, the lie of it will be exposed. Scales fully. will fall off the eyes. Yeah. And, then, and people say, oh, okay, I've had it done. Um, and I think that happens. Uh, that's what Americans do. I'm an immigrant. I came from Canada, adopted this country. <laughs> so now I'm dual. I, can ident- I don't identify as Canadian anymore because the, you know, the prime minister there is an embarrassment to the history of a former great nation. <laughs> But full on, full on socialist, and I don't say that as an insult. He's a self-professed yeah. socialist. But it, the America, Americans have, you know, the, the expression. I think Churchill said it, and then Thatcher repeated it. And it's it's apocryphal in in Britain to observe that Americans be counter to try everything, right? But they're, they're reliable and eventually doing the right thing. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing. I, I think we we will, and we have the luxury we can afford it. Yeah, I, I mean, this certainly qualifies as overspending on underperformance. <laughs> How about? I think I picked that up one of your me, one of your presentations. It, it, think about this. Here's the Fed. Here's the Fed. Yeah. Wants to fight inflation. All right. And we, we now reading in the news, it's having a hard time. So everybody's worried that interest rates will be ratcheted up again. And so Chairman Powell answered a question to a in a Senate hearing where the question was, you know, your job is to you haven't done a very good job here of tamping down inflation, Mr. Powell. And his answer was, and I'm paraphrasing him was. We, we uh, want to control half the equation. And what he was referring to was the spending side. Sure. Yeah. So everyone is saying that we're, be, you know, with the inflation uh, that's caused by the COVID spending, the insane amount of allocations of money, gifts to people, trillion to $2 trillion, depending on how you measure it, that's already baked in, but it's not going to happen again. Wait a minute. Yes, it is. The in- insanely named Orwellian Inflation Reduction Act yeah. entails 2 to $3 trillion yet more spending that has yet to be spent. And the money is going to produce the same product that we already get for less money, right. cars and energy. This is the very definition of inflation. So you know the Fed is looking at this train wreck of trillions to be spent to send the same electrons to your house, but less reliably at higher cost, to set the same vehicle into market but less reliably, the sense of its utility function to you at higher cost. Where did the, what, are, what other definition is there, is there for inflation? So we're gonna print money to do that. It's called inflation. And we're gonna spend more on the products that we need and the services with the more expensive supply of energy and minerals, which is called inflation. So we have a double whammy. I, I think that'll be obvious very quickly. Um, it's, it's hard to paper over that forever. The Excel um, service territory is a good example where the average homeowner's average monthly electric bill for the average residence was it's about 600 bucks a month, uh, sorry, a year for the average homeowner, 600 bucks a year, manageable. Uh, now it's going to be $1,800 a year. Okay. Uh, you, middle class family could probably afford the 1800 you could say. But wait a minute. I mean, their wages, it, one of their marginal costs went up triple. Their wages didn't triple in the last seven or eight years. And the cost of food they're buying, as we know, is up. The cost yeah. of fuel they're buying is up in terms of their, fu- their vehicles. And now we're going to tell them they have to buy electricity to drive their car with a commodity whose price they've tripled in the last decade, chasing the holy grail of so-called carbon-free electricity. Yeah, wow. Wow. Well, this is, I mean, just a gross misallocation of capital at the end of the day on, yeah. on, a, on a scale that rarely seen. Uh, I think it's the biggest misallocation of capital in American history. And I think that does, sounds like hyperbole. So I started doing amateur sleuthing on this. Uh-huh. How much money has the U.S. federal government spent on big visions allocated? I mean, just go back over uh, history. I and look, 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 the biggest number I could come up with was World War II. I couldn't come up with a number bigger than World War II. Yeah. We issued war bonds, did deficit spending, and World War II, over the period of roughly the four years prosecuted the war, was $4 trillion in today's dollars. And the, you know, the Great Society spending and oh, yeah. uh, all that maybe approaches the, the $2 trillion range. I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not $4 trillion. The Inflation Reduction Act is going to be $3 trillion. There's been no industrial policy undertaken in America, in American history, uh, of this scale, 
that will achieve so little. I mean, I want to do Churchill again. Yeah. Never has so much been spent for so little <laughs> by so few people who have such poor idea of the state of our economy. And, and, and I don't think the CBO has, has fully you know, mm. gotten their hands around the, the dollar amount, the $3 trillion you cited, because yeah, yeah. well, that, that wasn't the initial cost estimate. So they were costing uh, appropriations as opposed to, for example, the battery subsidies that are handed out. So if you build a battery assembly plant in America and you're going to be buying supplies from China, let's be yeah. clear, because the refined input materials mostly are ref refined there, um, you get paid directly as, a, as the factory owner a subsidy of so many dollars per kilowatt hour of batteries forever. There's no limits. Not, not, is that right? It doesn't, it doesn't cap when you produce X number of batteries or you get, you, you get this fixed amount of money. It just keeps flowing until Congress says stop. It's a, I, I was shocked when I saw it. I'll give you another shocking piece of news. They papered over the $7,500 subsidy. You get, you get a check, which you've now moved from your tax return, cleverly, to you get it right at the dealer showroom now. It's very clever. Rewrite of the law, but you can do that. You know, it's just, I've got a paper and a uh -huh. pen, so rewrite that. Um, and, but that only uh, attaches to a vehicle that a certain percentage of the material sourced by American firms okay. or free trade partners. So you don't get the subsidy if it's a Hyundai electric vehicle. Oh, really? But give the Democrats credit for this when they wrote it, because it was a pure partisan bill, as you know. If the vehicle's leased, it's exempt from that. <laughs> well, Shazam. What percentage of electric vehicles do you think are leased versus purchased? I don't most, know. most are leased. And why would you lease a, an EV rather than purchase one? Well, because you have no idea what its residual value is. The residual value for the Cognizant I release is the presumed value of the vehicle at the end of your three year lease that the owner of the vehicle attaches arbitrarily to the vehicle. Arbitrarily in the sense that they're guessing the future value of your Jaguar or your Cadillac that's gasoline powered based on a rich piece of history of what those vehicles are worth three years later in the used car market. Okay. An electric vehicle, I would propose that nobody has any idea what it's worth three to five years out because the technology changes rapidly. Nobody knows if anybody really wants to use the one in the first place. So you're attaching an arbitrary lease value to it to arbitrarily reduce the cost of the lease. And on top of that, you get the subsidy because it's exempt from the domestic requirement restriction. I think, do think there's a political revolution brewing in all this uh, because the consequences are high it's, and it's obvious. It's hard to hide. It's, yeah. You can't hide the cost of used cars. They're up, up a lot. New cars are expensive. Yeah. EVs are expensive. Electricity well, is expensive. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and, and this is in, in the, as it relates to um, the, the, the forward-looking planning that China did with with regards yeah. to EVs yeah, and so the fact that they are now in in a very sweet spot of the whole EV evolution. Yeah. Um, can you go into some of the details on that? They, obviously, they were thinking ahead of us on on this, and they weren't secret about it. In their ten-year plan ten years ago, they they wrote and told us what they were going to do. So we just we meaning the West collectively yeah. just ignore those things. So think about the arbitrage of what China's engaged in, because it is a, it is a brilliant uh, maneuver, and it's understandable. You have to give them credit for this. They're, they're the world's biggest importer of, of uh, oil. They're the, the world's biggest importer of natural gas. They're the world's biggest importer of coal. Uh, they are an energy importer. And oil is particularly important, as we're talking about transportation economies. It can't, can't be substituted in military markets, uh -huh. cannot be substituted in aviation markets. So what would you do? Okay, uh, China is now half of all the electric vehicles on the road in the world are in China. More than half of all the sales are in China. So China's a special case. Chinese EV makers have a special relationship with the suppliers. So they are getting a lot lower cost input materials. They get a lot lower cost capital. They get lower, oh, the whole regulatory structure is oriented around subsidizing that industry there. And it, it's a beautiful arbitrage. Their, gr their electric grid is two thirds coal fired, which is why they make 90% of the world's polysilicon that makes solar panels possible. Because silicon, the energy to make a pound of silicon is 100 times higher than the energy to make a pound of steel. So silicon is made where energy is cheap. It's made with electrical energy. What a shock. China is the primary source of the world's polysilicon because they have a coal fired grid. That also means electric cars for the first time buyer, kind of cars most Americans wouldn't buy, don't buy. 
uh, is a is a great is a great option because it's subsidized, it's inexpensive in China, and they, they're fine fueling it overnight and driving short distances. It's, it's okay, but it's coal that fuels those cars. At night, it's not a two thirds grid. It's almost all coal at night. That's their base. That's their base load power. So they're fueling their vehicles with domestically produced coal fired electricity instead of imported American oil. And while they subsidize the industry that makes the chemicals to make that battery po possible, they're exporting those chemicals to us to feed our battery plants, which depress our economy because we have a, it's a great arbitrage. They buy less oil from us, sell us battery chemicals and refined materials to make batteries and harm our economy while they benefit their economy. It's a beautiful, it's a, it's a beautiful trade to, to, to say it in sort of or very, you know, Machiavellian terms sure. for China. Um, and on top of that, here's China who spent the last two decades building up the refinery capacity for critical minerals, which includes aluminum, by the way. It's a critical mineral. They produce 60% of the world's aluminum on their cheap coal-fired grids. Aluminum is also very energy intensive. Electric cars use three to 800 pounds more aluminum than a conventional car because the battery weighs a half ton and you gotta do something to offset that weight. So you use energy intensive aluminum, which most of which is produced in China. Certainly not here. We drove our aluminum industry out years ago. So their market share, not in mining, this is what's critical, in refining raw minerals, which is copper and aluminum and nickel and manganese and cobalt and all the rare earths. They have a 50 to 80% global market share in refining of critical minerals. All of which are necessary for the so-called energy transition vision. All of which are necessary for everything else in our society. That sounds like a chokehold or an okay. OPEC like... like They have double the market share of OPEC. For, for o these critical in, minerals. So energy mineral market share for China is double OPEC's market share for oil, double. So far, they have not exercised any pricing power. I think it would be more than profoundly naive to think that China will never exercise uh, geopolitical or pricing power associated with critical minerals. Why wouldn't they? And they sent a little warning shot across the bow uh, last month. They restricted the export of a critical mineral called germanium. Who cares? Germanium is a rare mineral that has to be mined and refined China refines something on order of 90% of the germanium for the world. Germanium is essential in all kinds of microprocessors and in solar devices and in military devices. It's non-substitutable. You have to have the germanium. Um, but they didn't pick a high profile, big volume thing. This was, the, this was the equivalent for them. And this I don't mean this to compliment the Chinese, but I'm talking about it in a strategic sense. Uh, when my favorite president, maybe yours, Ronald Reagan, in the early 80s, implemented a tariff on Japanese motorcycles. I mean, who cares about motorcycles? I mean, think about it. Why did he do that? He gave a speech, which I always challenge my free market friends to look up. It's still available online, in which he said about that tariff, if this is his words, if it sounds like protectionism, it is. <laughs> it's Reagan. And he saved Harley Davidson against the, the Japanese onslaught from motorcycles. Why did he pick motorcycles? Because it was a shot across the bow to the then rising dominance of the Japanese automakers. They ought to think about building factories here. Well, Shazam, within a year, the first Japanese auto factory was built by Honda in Ohio and the rest, as I say, is history. So he, he sent a, a warning shot across the bow. The Japanese said, well, you know, we can build, we can build factories there too, and did. So China, China's done the same thing, uh, a little warning shot on, on a niche that's important. Um, we could we could do it. We could mine we could mine and refine germanium, but you have to choose to do that. We we as a as a country have chosen to do the inverse. We are not friendly to mining, expanding it. In this administration, while it's been pushing subsidies for say copper and nickel, which are critical to electric vehicles overseas, has actually novated, reversed permits from three mines in the last year in the United States. Companies that went through millions of dollars in years of permitting. To open new mines and expand them in America, reversed. Now that will be seen as illegal because it is. They had all the permits. Which which uh, department the, would that be? Would that be Department of Interior or Department of? Well, you can you can exercise any way what, but EPA. But the EPA EPA, did. Just, okay. EPA is the, is the go to. Now what will happen ultimately is that the companies will sue. The government can be sued. 
the government violates its own laws. And in due course, I would predict all three of those uh, illegal actions will be reversed. But in due course means millions, millions of dollars of legal oh, work. Yeah. And know. as one of the CEOs said to me at a, at a meeting, like we're gonna be having later today, I will probably not be alive when we finally open the mine because it's gonna take that many years to get our, our, our permit recognized as valid. The point I'm making there is that the charade that we're doing uh, subsidies to help American mining by using misusing the Defense Production Act to sprinkle a few million here and there at a lithium mine in North Carolina, a lithium potential lithium resource in, in Nevada, is just all virtual singling and showboating. We need to spend billions of dollars. They have to be private capital spent, and they're not going to spend the billions of dollars unless they think they're going to be allowed to open and operate their mine, and wow. they don't think that'll be the case in America today. Oh man. This has really been information, <clears throat> extraordinarily uh, valuable information, and I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us, Mark. Is there any other questions I should ask? My gosh, this, is, this has been great. Thanks so much for coming to town. Thanks for having and me. And sitting down with us. In the great state visit, of Mississippi. In the great state of Mississippi. Yeah. We did have a, a power plant that um, oh. <laughs> Steel Dynamics announced uh, a aluminum plant, a greenfield aluminum plant up in northeast Mississippi. Hallelujah. About, uh, it's about 10, 10 months ago. Uh, they're going to build an aluminum plant there. I think it's about a $2 billion investment. Excellent. I think it's in the TVA uh, yeah. power right. they're, area. They're, they're betting that TVA's yeah. electric rates will stay reasonable right. for a long time. That's probably a good bet. Um, in the, and we could hope there'll be a lot more of that. I mean, America could repatriate a lot of its manufacturing if the manufacturing uh, sector believed that they'd be allowed to A, get cheap energy and be able to finish building the plant once they start. Sure. I, 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 my guess is that Steel Dynamics saw what was going on in Germany yeah. and, and with the sure. problems with the Russian gas and yeah. all and decided this sure. was an opportunity. No, it's smart. It and also, down. back to China. So China's about 60% uh, of world's aluminum. Uh, you, you could make a reasonable guess that they might try to exercise pricing power in aluminum at some point. Yeah. And there may even be laws or tariffs again in the future because whether they're Republicans or Democrats, Everyone looks at, at dumping, and, and dumping is real. It does happen. But yeah. It's hard to uh, it's, it's it's hard to see right away, and it's hard yeah. to get done through WTO. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Mark. I Thank appreciate you. it.